things, um, they're deciding to do it now in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, again, uh, as far as qualifications, you do have to be uh, immunized, inoculated. You do, do have to receive the vaccine. Do you have to receive both doses of the vaccine? Yes. Yeah. You do? Okay, Joseph says yes. Yeah. Thank so you, I'll, sir. Yeah, I'll look that up. Yeah. What, what we do know, obviously. He's Filipino. He has his PhD in raffles. <laughs> right, sir. What we what we do know as far as the as the eligibility, <laughs> and then uh, I should say the non eligibility. So uh, the governor's yeah. cabinet members they're not are eligible. Not, are not eligible, yeah, but their kids are. But this, <laughs> no, but you know, know you know who is eligible? The Ooh. senators. The senators are, yeah, definitely, um, including Madam Speaker. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know if she did. You uh, sign up for their raffle, Madam Speaker? Not that I remember. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> She's had a few things going on in the past few weeks. Right, yeah. right, right. I Boy, wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something if you won ten grand or a car? Good morning, Madam Speaker. Morning. Uh, Seven forty. Yeah, guys. So we do our update with the uh, Speaker Theresa Lahi uh, here on the link, and of course, uh, there's always a lot to talk about, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, but we'll go ahead and give you the floor uh, at, at the onset. Uh, find out what uh, what's on your mind this morning. Oh, well, we're in the middle of session now. So uh, we've, you know, we've gone through a couple of bills. Uh, this morning is kind of a big day. We're going to be going through the bill for financing of the health care center, the complex. And uh, this bill proposes, uh, it's sponsored by Senator Joseph Augustine and, it, and others. And it, it proposes to take the earned income tax refunds reimbursement that uh, Guam is slated now to receive and uh, put about um, I think 36 million of that towards uh, this health care center every year and so this would be uh, I think in this proposal they authorize uh, other you know different types of financing but one of them is the uh, lease back financing so that's one bill another bill we're going to be addressing this morning in the committee of the whole is also a uh, a bill that uh, it's sponsored by the vice speaker that's going to allow uh, persons at the prison to um, be able to call their lawyers and their families. And I guess it's the way that they've been charged that uh, we're trying to affect by this bill, the cost to them, or uh, so to allow that to, a service to be provided like that in the prison. That's um, those are the two in the committee of the whole. We're mm -hmm. going to resume. A, uh, after that, back on bills 108 and 109, which yeah. are uh, relative to adoption. Yeah, I was and looking uh, at that, uh, Madam Speaker. I'm sorry, uh, but uh, in our report, it said that the bill had been set aside. Uh, yeah, we set it aside because uh, some of some of the senators wanted to get further clarification from the Department of Public Health. We had received a letter from the Deputy Director of the Department of Public Health yesterday right. during our deliberations and. Uh, uh, raising some concerns with the bill. And so some senators want to get clarification from public health. So we set it aside so that they can do that. Right. I was just looking actually at this uh, letter from public health uh, here. Um, and it, I guess the debate really centered on uh, rules and regulations for adoption agencies setting up shop on, on Guam, right? Was that your takeaway of it? Well, the bill changes uh you know it allows adoption agencies and it just says adoption agencies uh to do certain things on guam which currently only public health is allowed to do and so the rules and regulations concern is that you know if there are no rules and regulations as to you know how we are authorizing which which adoption agencies will be authorized or you know yeah. By what standards will they be approved or not approved? It doesn't even really require that public health approve them. And so that's what public health wants. So that that's kind of some of the debate. That was my debate as, um, in particular. I, I want, if public health is um, currently charged with the custody of children, you know, that have been given up for adoption or the custody of children that have been given up under that, uh, relinquished under the Safe Haven Act, then, um, you know, I want, and they're mandated to, you know, comply with all these uh, criteria. Then I want, I want all, I, I, I want these adoption agencies to be able to work with public health to ensure that this is happening. It's just kind of, um, I think in other jurisdictions that they do work with their, um, 
public health authorities or this type of authority to ensure that, you know, they're always regulated. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just going to kind of go over, uh, Madam Speaker, if, if you don't mind, just a couple of the recommendations that public health had made. There was a lot of recommendations actually made on this uh, bill. Um, well, first was on the intent. Uh, they said, in reference to a duly license under Guam law, is this pertaining to an agency's business license? provided by revenue tax, or is this referencing a process that needs to be developed which will license private adoption agencies in order to regulate? I'm not aware of a, existing rules and regulations for adoption agencies to be licensed on Guam. And so I think Senator Torres had argued that, oh, there were existing rules and regs for this type of thing on the books, but that's kind of where it got heated, right? Yes. Yeah, so obviously public health is saying there there aren't, right. and there, yeah. there has never been. And so... Uh, they're saying, you know, right now someone just gets to come in with a business license and say they are an adoption agency. And in this case, you know, we're lucky because this one has been licensed probably in Hawaii. That's what they've told us, yeah. right? And so that they're certified in Hawaii. However, yeah, that's what I think we just have to be on guard for is that uh, we don't want anybody to come in and set up shop and get a business license if that's all they're required to do and say that they are an adoption agency and then be able to take custody of children. So we want, you know, we want to be yeah. sure yeah. that public health is always in this process. It seems kind and of... I, I really think that they can, they can work together if, yeah. if they were allowed the opportunity that public health would work with this adoption agency. And I don't think we, we need to mandate it by statute. Uh, they also make a recommendation on Section 2 of the bill. Uh, selection of adoptive parents, adoption screening committee, composition of committee, page 3, line 1. A representative from an independent adoption agency. Question from Public Health Deputy Terry Ogan. If the adoption agency is doing business on Guam, how are they independent? Private versus public? In the interest of the process to ensure objectivity is maintained throughout the process, I do not recommend a representative from a private adoption agency serve on the adoption screening committee, as this would appear to be in conflict of competing interests. And that kind of seems to be the center, I don't know, just from my takeaway was that this bill is, it really seems to be serving up some very sweet conditions for this, the adoption agencies, whichever one it is. So, is that, so that's going to be continued tomorrow? Today. 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 So this morning, first thing we'll do we're, is going to committee of the whole on the two bills, the financing for the health care center bill and the the phone calls at the prison bill. Then we will get out of committee of the whole, go back to regular session on bills 108 and 109. Th those are the adoption bills and the safe haven bills. Um, yeah, so... What about Bill 112? Because it's going to, I know you had a press conference Friday and you came on the show yes. Friday. Haven't really, uh, you know, I try to reach out to Dr. Uh, Wen, uh, but we know he's on vacation. He's, I think he's doing a college send off for his daughter. So he hasn't been able to come on. But outside of him and the multiple letters that we saw from uh, various doctors and uh, Dr. Shea's incessant social media posting, what have you heard from? The doctors, has there been any development at all, or did they just kind of like put out all those letters about we're not going to do this procedure, we're not going to take care of these patients because we don't like this bill? Well, I've continued to receive letters from different healthcare professionals. Uh, some, um, I would say, mostly against the bill. I will admit that. Uh, a couple are in favor of it. But I think. Um, uh, you know, sometimes when I read the letters, I, they they are being quite general and saying uh, they don't like the bill. You know, any any change to the malpractice law is going to affect how they practice medicine, and um, and so I really want them to flesh that out. And I'm really hoping that during the public hearing, that when you know the public comes and the medical professionals come, that they're going to be able to be more, um, you know, um, detailed and. Uh, you know, and and in the last public hearings that we had, in, you know, we had several on, on this topic, right? We we took into account a lot of this, uh, uh, the threats by the doctors that, you know, we're going to leave Guam, first of all, if we, you know, can't get special coverage, or we're going to stop providing specialty care. And that one, of course, I think I want to say that that was one of the testimonies that really... Um, 
uh, stayed with me and I thought about it for a very, very long time. And that's one of the reasons why this bill that I propose does not go all the way. It does not repeal the medical malpractice mandatory arbitration completely. It, it gives another process, another screening process, again, that's not provided in 23 jurisdictions. And it gives this special process. I wanted to continue to allow a special process for doctors, but one that people who could not afford it right now could afford. And so they've got a special screening, screening process that um, I don't think, you know, um, that's one of the options was to, to allow no special screening process at all, but we have allowed it. And because, and another thing that we, I, I went out of my way to make sure that this bill would include the exact same standard of care that we have today, because that was the threat that we're going to change the way we practice. Well, if it's allowed today, then under my bill, that exact same standard of care that you are practicing is allowed tomorrow. It's the same. And so that's why I really want to hear more of the specifics as to, you know, they say, um, you know, that this is still going to change their standard, their, their, their way of practice, but I, I really need them to be specific on that because the, the standard of care is exactly the same. We, we made that very clear. So if they're saying what they've done today is okay under current law, then it should be okay tomorrow under current law. The only thing we're changing here is this process and the costs to go through, you know, a screening process. And that's it. Not, not any, you know, mandate of how they practice their medicine. I think, I think a, a question I'd want to know is how does this affect the doctor's bottom line? I mean, what, what is it going to cost uh, the doctors? Cause you're right. I mean, I've been following it really closely and we don't really see, well, the generalities that, um, we hear about are that, oh, it's going to make it easier for people to file frivolous uh, lawsuits. Um, and I know you've disagreed with that point uh, on previous appearances on the show. Yeah, that's that's what this screening process is all about. It's like you, it, it, it screens out the frivolous lawsuits. It, it tries to deter those. And it, um, it's the same as it is today if the standard of care, you know, you're going to have to prove negligence before you can even bring a case before a screening panel. And if, if you're not able to do that, they're going to, they're going to toss you out right away. So that, that part has not changed that standard, how you're going to be judged, whether it was negligence or not, none of that changes. It's really just how accessible is, is the, you know, uh, getting to the part where they're going to make that determination. And so bottom line, it, um, they're arguing that it kind of speculating, right? They're speculating that because now poor people can file a claim, then more claims might be filed. Then they might get more claims on their record. And then they might have to increase their, you know, malpractice insurance coverage or actually get malpractice insurance, which many of them don't even have right now, or that um, because they have so many claims filed against them, you know, they're speculating, then they might be denied malpractice insurance. Mm. All of that to me is speculation, but what I, I haven't affected any of that. I'm affecting whether a poor person can file a claim. And the alternative to that is that we continue with um, medicine, you know, protections where poor people cannot file a claim. Yeah. And so for me, that's the alternative. And that cannot be an alternative on Guam I'm proposing, right? I mean, I'm saying, you know, I don't think the people of Guam intended that. I don't think any doctor who supported the medical, the mandatory arbitration intended that it was going to, that the cost of it would be so prohibitive as to prevent poor people from filing claims. I don't think that was the intent. And I definitely don't think that now that we are on notice of it, that even doctors want that to happen. There are very many good doctors who are, who had in the past and who continue, I think, to believe that there is a way to go forward. And that's what I'm proposing, a way to go forward that, that continues to take care of doctors, to give them a special screening process before trial, a, continues the exact same standard of care today, and, a, and yet a process that can be afforded by poor people, you know, to file a claim. 
you know, it should be argued that, uh, you know, my process is, is not, it's not zero cost. It's still, there's still a huge yeah. cost. So there's still a burden and I'm not going to promise every poor person that they're going to be able to file yeah. a claim Which even I, under I, this that, process. That's kind of what I find interesting, Madam Speaker, is yeah. that it kind of looks like the bill you really wanted to do couldn't get done because you anticipated all this opposition to even kind of moving where we are now just a little bit forward. Right. Yeah. So, that's I mean, right. to me, that's shameful because you, I mean, oh, anyway, I got it. We're short on time. Uh, and I know that okay. you got a public hearing coming on, so I'm pretty sure we're going to be talking about this. But I wanted to well, con- see, uh, go ahead. Yeah. That's why I want them to work with me in good faith. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like the threats are not going to help them. Not, not in my book. You know, it's like work with me in good faith. If you recognize, as I recognize, and the people of Guam can recognize that poor people cannot file claims, Mm -hmm. then we need an alternative. This is one alternative that allows a a few more people to be able to file a claim. Still very difficult to file a claim and still the exact same standard of care for doctors. And I'm affording confidentiality where none was afforded in the prior law. And I'm affording, you know, a special screening process to doctors. And so... Yeah, I, I, I'm really asking that they work yeah. in good faith to come up with a, a better solution if they have one. I know that the solution that was proposed before that no one has put their name on to date, you know, that was withdrawn, is uh, that, that the taxpayers, you know, that we pay, yeah. that the taxpayers pay to cover the uh, malpractice costs, I mean, the arbitration costs. Yeah. And uh, I don't think that's necessary. I mean, we're going to cover part of that, but I don't think we need to covered to the extent that the doctors were asking for back then. Yeah, it's really unfortunate this is really starting to turn into patients versus doctors, right? And so you've got the vice speaker holding hands yeah. with the doctors, and then you've got you talking about the patients should have the right uh, for this process no, to be it, accessible. It shouldn't be. And I'm telling you, that's why I, I, I work so hard to try to find what I really believe is a compromise. Mm-hmm. And the doctors, you know, um, I'm hoping that they will read this for themselves and that they will 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 see that we can't do nothing. We have to do something, and that uh, you know that I have purposely not completely repealed any type of screening panel for medical care on Guam. We're still requiring there. There are people in the community who have advocated repeal it all together and be done with it, right? Just repeal it and let doctors be treated the way everybody else in the community is treated. But uh, we didn't do that. We allow, we continue to allow a special screening process, just one that is more affordable. And that's really it. And so the, this, the care that they practice today, they should continue to practice, you know, or, um, or they really should justify why they are not able to practice that today versus yesterday, you know, what changed? Um, that because it's not my bill, it's it's something else that uh, is I think leading them to do that. Or if they think they're doing that as a political, you know, response, then I I don't know mm. what to say about it. Sounds that sounds like something out of uh, Auntie Lou's playbook. <laughs> uh, we got just a couple minutes here, Speaker. Um, you know, we had doctors we had doctors threatening us before. Remember on the hospital when yeah. they came down here with the, you know, yeah. black armbands. That's, that's to me the where they kind of, that's the where they kind of lost me a little bit was, and I think people should know that you're right, nothing has changed. This bill has only been introduced and they're already sending letters to patients saying that, hey, we're not going to take care of you anymore. You've got 30 days to find someone else, which is, to me, just really disingenuous. Uh, but we, I want, we have a couple minutes. Congressman's speech, uh, your takeaways, any actionable items there that you took, you took interest uh, with? Um. Well, I agree with him on some of his things, you know, particularly the projects that I think what we should use this money for and uh, the projects that he is pursuing, for example, the Fisherman's Co-op, Mass Transit, you know, that that this money really should, uh, the ARP 600 million really should uh, help us to resolve longstanding issues. And he mentioned specifically the Chamorro Land Trust. And I, of course, I'm very happy that the Agent Orange um Legislation is going forward in Congress. We have a RECA bill that Robert Celestial has been working almost uh, weekly. He has phone calls with the staff of these senators who are actually drafting the bills. And uh, and so I want to commend him for his work. I think he's really been able to keep Guam in that that RECA bill. So I'm really looking forward to its introduction soon. And, and I want to thank him for his work on that. And, and of course... Um, 
uh, you know, the congressman's right that we we have an opportunity here that we have not been afforded on Guam in decades, and I I don't want to screw it up, and uh, I don't think anybody wants to, and so we just have to work together. But I I. I'm hoping that that's what we do, that uh, we're going to be able to work together to give the best ideas, to to finesse those ideas, and and that so that the people of Guam are also going to feel satisfied that, you know, they had input and that that their concerns are being met with this new money. Right. I thought it was interesting when he was uh, kind of doing that uh, piece at the end where he was really uh, imploring the wise spending of this ARP fund. Um, he said, with $600 million in funds available for deployment and other various uh, programs, there's no more EITC or Medicaid gap to fill. We'll not see a similar day confluence of circumstances that will bring our credit rating up and increase our debt ceiling capacity like we have today, which means the people in this room, to include myself, if we screw this up, we screw it up permanently. But I, I, the thing I thought was kind of funny was that he was uh, really saying, let's spend this money wisely, but we're not even spending it at all. It's sitting in the bank until maybe the end of July, which I still can't wrap my mind around. <laughs> um, me neither. Well, particularly for the rise, you yeah. know, for anything else that might be controversial, sure. then maybe, you know, hold the money. But yeah. for things that are not controversial, such as that, um, it, it really should be it. If they need the money and we're intending to give them the money and we've set by law to give them the money, let's give them the money. And and yeah, I don't see the reason for the delay. And I think that it could really help people right now. It's very obvious to me. And that, um, you know, even, I don't know, the longer we wait, the less impact, you know, $800 has. Yeah, you're right about that. Madam Speaker, I got to go, but thank you so much for uh, the you. update and good luck. Have a great day. Thank you. Take care. Uh, Bye, everybody. Madam Speaker Therese Terlahi. Uh, let's go ahead and do it. KUAM TV, here we come.